Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Danback. On this edition, we'll meet a Vietnam veteran, turn ice and wood into art, and listen to some original jazz compositions. Passing down recipes and teaching them to younger generations can create everlasting memories. Violet Deagle of Wishick, North Dakota, celebrates the food culture of the Germans from Russia by sharing her recipe for Stirum, a traditional German-Russian dish. I'm Violet Deagle, and this is Carmen Rothwald. She's my godchild. <laughs> my husband cooked with his mother. I learned to cook from my husband. I didn't know how to cook when I got married, and I had to cook for thrashers. Oh, my gosh. That was a nightmare, cooking for thrashers. Oh. Today we're making Stierum. In my godmother's kitchen in Wishick, North Dakota. You eat it with a cucumber salad or lettuce salad, and it's just a dish by, that's all you have for a meal is the Stierum and the salad. When my grandkids would come to my house up in the farm, and I'd make Stirum. They loved it. They called it crumbs, which it really is. <laughs> Adding one cup of milk to three eggs. And, and one teaspoon of one salt. One teaspoon of salt. One teaspoon of baking powder. Was it one and a half? Yep, one and a half, yep. And this is best over garden, fresh garden lettuce in the spring, right? Yeah, or cucumbers. Or cucumbers later mm -hmm. this time. It's almost like pancake batter. Yeah, right. So you gotta get in there and stir and cut. Yeah. <laughs> Here, this is your story. Ready. <laughs> yeah, I think it's done. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yum. That's good. Prairie Public produced a documentary called Prairie Memories, The Vietnam War Years, in which we recorded oral histories of people who served, who protested, or who were left behind. After receiving a Purple Heart, Army infantryman David Scherzer found the emotional impact of his time in combat far outlasted his physical wounds. My name is David Carl Scherzer. I live at present in Moorhead, Minnesota. I was in Vietnam from uh, November 4th, 1968 until uh, November 1st, 1969. I uh, was in the Army, was in the infantry. The Army infantry is known as the Queen of Battle and that is because you tend to get to be the most intimate with the enemy. They're shooting directly at you to try to kill you. You're shooting directly at them to try to kill them. So I have a Purple Heart. I was shot in the shoulder, almost killed, and they sent me to a hospital in Japan. And I was over there for a couple of months, and they stapled me back together and sent me back to Vietnam again. Anytime you got into any kind of engagement with the enemy, you knew that there was a very great possibility you could die. 
for quite a few years, the 4th of July was, was really hard for me. Uh, you know, your dog acts, uh, uh, you know, firecracker goes off and they go run the height under the bed kind of thing. Well, I'd, I'd be belly down to the floor and, you know, all of a sudden phew, I'd be on the floor, just like that. And it took me years to get, uh, to get over that. Fourth of July was, was pretty hard. And I still went to see fireworks and all that, but, but still when fireworks go off, my heart rate goes up a little bit. Um, one thing about uh, being in combat is it is so intense. I have more memories of that one year in Vietnam than I have of any other decade in my life. Fred Codulo's success comes from being a self-described contrarian. It was a failed third grade art assignment that started him on his path to international acclaim as a sculptor. With wood as his medium, the Wilmer, Minnesota native blends patience, skill, and humor to create his award-winning art. I think some people are just made to use their hands, and I kind of was always drawn to wood and to tools. This was meant to be my refuge. People drive me nuts. I love them, but they drive me nuts. Fred's work is really multifaceted. It's high quality. It's an interesting material. He's a well-known Minnesota artist. He's capturing an everyday life in a very hyper-realistic way. People really see the high skill that's involved, so they can appreciate it on kind of a skill level as well as an aesthetic level. Instead of taking something like clay, where you have both the option of putting it on and taking it off readily with wood, you take your um, material and you pretty much remove it. My father died when I was quite young, but he'd left a fairly well-equipped shop. So I was out there quite often trying to kill myself, doing bad things with the table saw, working with Disturbed adolescence, I had to uh, do one week of night watch every six week. After you did your rounds, your main job was to stay awake, and there was a block of wood there that one of the kids had started carving on and had given up after rounding a corner, and I thought I couldn't do any worse, so I went and I took it and came back the next night with some of my father's carving tools, his palm chisels, and then I was off to the races. They're traditional edge tools. They tend to be gouges of various sorts, and a gouge is basically uh, just a U shape. And then there's your V tools, and then your flat tools, which are your chisels, your firmers, and your skews. I designed a number of tools that were manufactured for a while, and I would say designed rather than invented, because basically you, you modify existing forms. I do photographic studies if it's a realistic thing, but I, I don't do any modeling in clay or anything else. I don't see the point of that. I figure if I do something twice. If I, I don't know what I want in some particular spot of a composition, I'll oftentimes leave a little extra wood there as I'm roughing things out in case something occurs to me as I'm doing it. So some of the design is usually on the fly. So this thing is titled, Don't Look Like Much of a Horse. And the subtitle is, Yeah, and You Ain't No Cowpoke Neither. And it's my tribute to my Late brother, it's, it's an experiment in deep relief. Rules in relief are basically that you try to use as much of the actual depth available as possible for the most important elements and the foreground elements, and that you try not to have the eye object. When you're carving from a log, your problems with the moisture are such that you need to get rid of wood as fast as possible, otherwise it'll all split. The only stable way I know of doing it is to hollow them out. The face is sort of like a landscape, and you try to follow the contours of it. I'm just trying to cheat that line of the lip up just that little bit. Go back and modify this again when it's all said and done. I have more lumber than I'll probably use in, if I live to be 400 years old, but yet I have this compulsive acquisition disorder, and I can't uh, pass up a good 
lumber tree of some sort or other. People are fond of referring to me as a master woodcarver, and I'm really not because I'm not adept at a lot of the furniture carving and, and uh, decorative arts. There are even a lot of weaknesses in my human figures. The main thing is I try to get enough feeling and character. And these people seem to relate to them somehow. It would be a mistake to underestimate uh, Fred by saying it's kind of almost a pedantic rural craft or something that's just only about tradition. With the humor and the politics that are in the work, it's actually quite sophisticated. With carving, it's, it's a lot like getting married. You don't realize the full extent of your commitments until you're well into it. You have to live up to your commitments or else it's a messy divorce. Transforming a 300 pound block of ice into a work of art is quite an accomplishment. But culinary arts instructor Kim Brewster loves his work. He uses a chainsaw and various chisels to carve ice into spectacular sculptures for his customers' special events. I got into ice originally with my first instructor. It's been 37 years ago, probably when I started. The tools and equipment and techniques have certainly changed over the years from using a handsaw to cut things uh, into chainsaws and routers and the chisels are uh, a lot nicer. Back then ice wasn't really available and I remember going out to the Dilworth train yards and you went to a big building and they pulled a block of ice out of sawdust that they used to use to tr cool down the refrigerated cars on the train. So it wasn't always pretty and it wasn't always the same size. Probably the real thing that, that uh, forced me into it even heavier is when I interviewed in St. Cloud to teach in the cooking program there. And one of the questions was, can you teach ice carving? I said, well, absolutely. So I had to learn real quick, real fast. There's many technique books out there on new techniques that are available. And so I try and get those and incorporate new techniques that I use today that I probably didn't use eight years ago. We do make our own ice and our ice blocks are 20 inches wide by 40 inches high and 10 inches thick. And that's just an industry standard, whether it's here in New York or California or Texas. You will get wet on this ride. And so I do have rubber boots on to uh, keep me a little bit drier. Uh, also, the chaps that I'm wearing are a safety chap that are made out of Kevlar uh, that if for some reason you'd hit yourself with a chisel or the chain or something, it's going to protect from getting cut. I'll be using the foam earplugs uh, to keep some of that noise blocked out so I can save my hearing a little bit. The ice lift that we have is adjustable to get that up to a height uh, that's safe for carving. And so we'll raise this up a little bit to start with. And now we're ready to begin. The first step is sticking a template on the ice and just taking the tip of the chainsaw and kind of tracing out your pattern. I use a, a light coated bond paper. Uh, if it isn't coated at all and we wet that paper down, it's going to fall apart when we try and pick it up. We always start working from the, the top of the block. If I take a chunk out down here and another chunk from up here hits, here it breaks away my ice. So I just want to start at the top, work down toward the bottom, and take off unneeded ice that we don't need. We've removed all the excess ice, but now everything is 10 inches thick and there's no three-dimensional to it at all. What has to be taken away now to start shaping it and make it look like something? Once that work is done, uh, then the hand chisels are used to finish shape it. And then after that, uh, additional chisels, V-tools, gouges uh, to put in the accent marks that really catch the light. Actual carving time on most carvings, somewhere between one and two hours. The last step is then to wash it down uh, with some water to see if you have any imperfections or where you need to trim up and to get rid of any snow or ice chips and it really clears it. Back in the freezer, 
and it's ready for delivery to the customer. Somebody says, can you kind of draw me what you're thinking? And if they go by my drawing, you'd never have me do it. If you wanted a straight line, I'd draw it crooked, and if you want a crooked line, I'd probably draw it straight. I am a, I guess I would call it more of a visual artist, uh, that I can see it in there. There's a ton of things that I've carved. For weddings, it can vary from, we want swans, we want hearts, we want lovebirds. The crystal vase is probably the most elegant, but then you get the additional expense for a wedding of putting flowers in, and that's not, not always so cheap. Functional ice carvings as well. Uh, if they'd like to, we'd like something that we can put fresh fruit in. Uh, we'd like a punch bowl that we can serve punch out of. We want a clamshell that we can serve shrimp cocktail in. What really helps is being a chef because I know the problems that are out there. Uh, if they're going to use it functionally, do I need to drill some holes so the shrimp doesn't sit in water? Normally I tell people if you've got a wedding or a function and we set it up at, at 5 or 6 o'clock, it's still going to be there at midnight. The only thing that melts in proportion, uh, the fine details, they won't be as crisp, uh, but you'll be able to tell what it is. I always include a what I would call a drip tray. So as the ice melts, it goes through a tubing behind the table that it is set up on and into a five gallon pail. It's a fun hobby and, and I enjoy doing it. The real thing is the wows or the customers looking at it and, and all the kids coming up and they have to touch it, whether it's a kid that is four years old or a kid that's 85 years old. Um, they all want to touch it, they want to feel it, and is that really ice? Max Jonk is a bassist, composer, and teacher. He and a few other talented musicians from the Fargo-Moorhead area visited our studio to play some original jazz compositions.
My name is Max Junk. I play bass and uh, write the tunes for the Max Junk group. I've been writing music for uh, jazz groups for the last several years. Most of the music I've been writing up to now has been for very large groups. As sort of a challenge for myself, I wanted to start writing music or arranging my older music for a smaller group. So I, I guess I, you know, I need to shout out Joel, Chris, and Steve in particular for being um, really fun people to play with and really interesting musicians. They bring a lot of creativity to it and a lot of you know, fire. They don't just show up and play the part, which doesn't work in jazz music. You need to have people that are gonna embody the music. So that's my goal for the time being is to get a lot of music spun up for these guys. If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at Prairie Mosaic at prairiepublic.org. I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Danback. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic.
Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public.